Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. In these chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, we are learning about the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. And he starts to get in trouble with the Jewish leaders, with the religious elite there in Jerusalem. And as he's turning over tables in the temple and as he's saying really hard things in his preaching, they want to know just who in the world this man believes that he is. And he answers them that question in three ways. We uh, saw the first two responses earlier. We come to the third response in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, and Jesus is provocative. Jesus insults the Jewish leaders. One of the last things that he's going to say in this response to them is that many are called, but few are chosen. He's saying to God's chosen people, Israel, He's saying to these Jewish leaders and representatives of those chosen people that you better not be cocky about being included in the kingdom of God. Because many are called, but few are chosen. You might not be as chosen Jewish leaders as you think you are. It's a shocking response. It's a shocking statement, not just to the Jewish leaders 2,000 years ago, but to us today. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, this is what God says. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who'd been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner and my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you please come to us now? It is so clear and so obvious that there is nothing good in this room that can last forever unless you make it happen. So I'm asking you to come in the power of your spirit to open your word and open our hearts and change our lives forever. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you today about the most precious thing in your life. And I want to talk to you about that most precious thing that you possess by telling you a story about one of the times 
when it occurred to me just how precious it was. I was standing by the bedside of my mother. She had been given six months to live, and we were in month four, and it was clear she was not going to make it even hours longer than that. We watched her breathing move from being labored to being very faint. We had had to move her into the inpatient hospice ward at a hospital because her body was shutting down and horrible things were happening that we weren't able to deal with in our, in our home. And I'd been sitting by her bedside nearly uninterrupted for a couple of weeks, and it was, just, it was just so obvious that the end was coming. The nurses assured us that the end was near, and I looked at this woman who was breathing her last breaths, and I was overcome with emotion, and I nearly flung myself uh, on her, and I uh, wept, and I prayed, and I whispered in her ear that, Mom, I love you, and Jesus loves you, and we will be together soon. And not long after that, she did die. And I was, I was looking at the remains of this woman. And her body had gone from being weak and frail to being twisted and ugly. And as I looked at this, this tent that no longer had any life left in it, I, I marveled at this life that had vanished into heaven. And I, it, has never, it has never ever been lost on me since it happened, the preciousness of the moment that this, this woman who had been so profoundly influential and had so profoundly shaped my life, and we were both together when I came into the world, and we were both together when she left the world. And I thought about this, this life, and, and I wondered, what, what is that, that life that has gone? It's no longer there. What, what is that? That life, when we talk about it, when we talk about your life, it's usually you talking about it. Usually when you talk about your life, it's you talking, and you are talking about the succession of events in it. You talk about what you've done or what you want to do or who you know or uh, what you've accomplished or what you failed at doing. That life, though, that you have is the most precious thing that you've got. You, you only get one. It's amazing. You, you only get it once. And as you sit here listening to me today, what you have lived is already gone. You, you can go back and reclaim nothing. You can't go and undo things that you regret. You can't go and experience again things that you have enjoyed. And one day soon, very soon, and you won't even know when that one precious thing will go away and you will never have it to do over again. It's the most precious thing you've got and I want, I want to do something today. I want to ask you to let me do something with that precious life of yours. See, Jesus is telling this parable to Jewish leaders who are rejecting him, and he is telling them the way this life works. But here's the thing. Those Jewish leaders, they were listening 2,000 years ago. They're not here now. You are. 
words. So I want to talk to you. And I, I want to let you know that this parable is the story of your life. I want to ask you to let me do something with your life, to enter into it for, for a few minutes. And instead of you talking about your life in the series of events that make it up, I want to let you listen to me tell you the story of your life. I, I want you to let me tell you the story of your life and when I tell you the story of your life, I, I'm not going to tell you the story of the succession of events that you're living through, which is the way you often think of your life. What I want to do for the next few moments is tell you the story of your life as God would have you to hear it. I want you to hear your life as God intervenes in it. I want you to hear your life as you hear it from a Godward direction in what God is doing in your life. And I'm going to tell you the story of your life in three chapters from this parable of Jesus that changes your life. And here's the first chapter. Your life is a story of God's great effort to include you in his love. More than any event, more than any other relationship, your life is the story of the great effort of the living God to include you in his love. This parable is a parable about a king. It's a parable about a wedding feast. And it's a parable about a son. It's a parable about you. Jesus is talking about your life. The king is God. The son is Jesus. And the wedding feast is God's life of love. It is his kingdom. It is the celebratory existence that he lives by virtue of who he is. And God is asking you to be included in it. God loves you and wants you to be involved in all the goodness and the glory and the greatness and the majesty and the wonder and the joy and the fun of knowing him. That's what this is about this parable is about your life, and your life is a story of God's repeated invitations for you to join him. This is what your life has always been about, these repeated invitations. In verses 3 and verse 4, he sent out slaves to call those who'd been invited to the wedding feast. God sends servants. He sends prophets. He sends apostles. He sends preachers to invite you to be a part of what God is doing. But you're unwilling to come. The people who hear the invitation that God that God wants you, that God loves you, that God has a wonderful and incredible, joyous life for you. The invitation comes, and you're unwilling to come. But God is undeterred. In verse 4, he, he sends more people again. He sent out other slaves saying, tell those who've been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. He's saying, this is wonderful. He's, he's talking to hungry people. He's talking to needy people and he's enticing you with how great this is going to be. There's, there's fattened calves, there's animals, all the work's done. There's a huge party, there's food for everybody. The wedding feast is ready. All you have to do is come. This is Jesus in the parable. 
saying that when the servants, when the slaves, when the preachers, when the apostles come, they're engaging in a description of everything that is delightful about the life of God. There is a God who's beautiful. There's a God who's perfect. There's a God who never started being and will never stop being, and he is perfect and and righteous, and he never mistreats anyone. And even when he has enemies, he has a wonderful son that he sends to live and to die and rise. And now because of that work of Jesus, because he's paid for your sin, because he's defeated death, everything's taken care of. Everything's ready, and all you have to do is come. There's nothing left for you to do. It's wonderful, and it's glorious, and you can have it right now. But they're unwilling to come. You are unwilling to come. But he he still sins the invitation. When, when the first round of guests refuse to come, when they refuse to listen, he sends his servants out to an even larger group of people, and these people are mind-blowing who he invites. He goes out into the streets. He goes out into the highways. He goes out into the gutter <laughs> to invite people that will blow your mind. Look at verses 9 and 10. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. This is so great and so glorious I'm telling you, I don't even know how to explain it. When Lauren and I got married, we had a wonderful celebration. Italians know how to throw a wedding. We had a, we had a wonderful celebration. It's one of the grandest parties I've ever been to was this marriage to my Italian wife. And we spent a lot of time thinking about who to include in this great party. We wanted to share our joy. We wanted to share the blessing of being together. We wanted to share our first day together with wonderful people. And as we talked about who we would invite, we invited a lot of wonderful people. And we didn't invite any evil, nasty, wicked people. Not even one. (laughs) You know if you've ever planned a wedding, is there any way we can keep from getting an invitation (laughs) to that person? There's second cousins twice removed that every time they show up, weird things happen. And you don't want them there. But God invites rebels to the wedding of his son. He invites everybody. He goes into the streets and he finds the people that we we think are worthless. And he says, come into the wedding. Listen, he invites you if you think you're worthless. Listen to me say, it is blasphemous to say that God doesn't want you because you're a sinner. Whatever the sin is that you're thinking about, whatever the horrible thing is that you have done that you believe keeps you out, God, your king, who's perfect in righteousness and knows more about your sin than you do, he says, come, you're welcome. No matter how wicked, no matter how wrong, you're welcome to come in. This is a demonstration of infinite love for you. God who's perfect loves rebels. God who's righteous loves sinners. 
God, through his Son, makes a way for you to come. This is your life. This is the story of your life. You as a sinner receiving repeated and grand invitations to be a part of eternal joy with a great and perfect God who loves you. Even though you're a sinner, it's the best thing you've ever heard because you don't have to be good enough You don't have to be grand enough. You don't have to be righteous enough. It's why we sing and really, really mean that we can come just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that you bid me come to thee. All we've got going for us is that Jesus' blood was shed for us and he takes us just as we are. That's the invitation and that's the joy and that's the first chapter of your life. That your life is a story of God's great effort to include you in his love. Here's the second chapter. Your life is a story of God's great effort to change you with his love. Your life is a story of God's great effort to change you with his love. All these people are invited. They go out into the streets where the wicked and the worthless people are. And they come in. And then this strange thing happens. Verses 11 to 12. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests... He saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without any wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. The king has invited everyone to come who wants to come. He's invited the worthless people to be there who would otherwise have no expectation of being invited. But then when he gets into the wedding, he notices that there is a man there who hasn't put on wedding garments. Now listen, you need to know that in the, in the first century, what you needed to wear to a wedding was not what you're expected to wear to a wedding today. <laughs> In our weddings today, you can have some people in tuxedos, you can have some people in coats and ties, you can have some people with brand new spiffy dress. That wasn't what was required in the first century. In the first century, all you had to have was basically some light colored clothing that was basically clean. That's what you had to have. And that kind of clothing was available to anybody. But even more than that, there are records of kings, kings like this king, who provided the wedding clothes for the wedding guests. Kind of like a restaurant. Like if you're going to go to a fancy restaurant and you uh, come schlepping in and you've got some t-shirt on and like, sorry, you have to wear a sport coat or something like that. So they give you one, you know, they come out and put one on so you don't embarrass them by sitting in their restaurant. That's what, that's what kings would do in the first century. They, they wouldn't want you to sully the crowd. And so if you were invited, they would give you robes and dress for the wedding. The the point of this is that God in his love invites you to come to him as you are. But once you come to him as you are, God in his love does not leave you as you are. This is a passage of Scripture that is teaching that after you come just as you are, once that happens, you are to change. The invitation to sit at the marriage supper of Jesus Christ is an invitation to sit at his table and look at him and love him and receive him and become more and more like him the more you look at him. There's no category for a person who is too bad 
to come to Jesus. And there is also no category for a person who has come to Jesus and stays bad. It is a demonstration of the love of God for you to save you and bring you in and to change you. Some of you, I know, I know some of you are sitting here with incredible struggles and incredible sin. Some of you are struggling with things that folks know about. Some of you are struggling with things that only you know about. And I want to say two things to you about that today. First of all, don't think it doesn't matter. Don't think that having received the loving invitation to come in, that you can resist the loving invitation and the loving power to change. The king looks at this man who was invited just as he was, but he didn't change. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. The man had no excuse. There's, there's, no, there's no excuse for seeing Jesus, for seeing love and not changing. I want you to know if you're stuck, you don't have to be. And this is the second thing. There is great grace and great power for you. The love of God that calls you in is the love that will change you. It's not up to you. I feel stuck. I know that's the point. God isn't stuck. I don't feel like I have enough power to change. I know that's the point. God has the power and he will give it to you. He's not going to invite you to come in and leave you as you are. Listen to these great words of this great prophet in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. He says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is a great prophecy of a great promise of grace that you're going to be different. That God loves you and he's given you everything you need to change. He's given you everything you need to come in. Jesus has died for you. And when Jesus died for you, he didn't just die to bring you in. He died to make you different. And now you will be different. You will be different. Struggling person with sin, I don't care what it is. Jesus' blood sets you free. Listen, listen to Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 to 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you see the love of Jesus for you? The love of Jesus to save you from sin and the love of Jesus to set you free from sin. You will be different and you'll be different forever. And you say, hallelujah, amen and amen to Jesus Christ. God calls you in in his love. And God changes you in his love. The second chapter of your life is God is making you different. You're not in heaven yet, but you're not what you were. In the great love of God, and here's the third chapter. Your life there's a story of God's great effort to warn you about refusing his love. This is a great story of God's love. Your life is a great story of God's love. And in this display of love, there is a really sobering display of judgment. There's a terrifying description of eternal pain. There is terrible judgment for anyone who is invited to come into the life and the kingdom of God and who refuses. 
in chapter 22, verse 7. These people go their way, and the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set fire to their city. This is, this is a parabolic description of hell, destruction and fire to anyone who won't believe, to anyone who won't turn, to anyone who would receive the invitation and say, no, I'm not going to do that. There's a terrible description of judgment for those who respond to the invitation but make an attempt to come into the kingdom without changing and prove they don't belong. In verse 13, after this speechless man, it's obvious he hasn't changed, and the man is speechless. He is without excuse. And the king said in verse 13 to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus describes a terrible reality for religious pretenders who try to sneak into the banquet without really knowing the love of God to change them, without really encountering his grace. And if you are a religious pretender and you try to sneak around in the wedding hall without changing, You'll be bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness. And it is this description of an eternal death where all you do is writhe in pain and grit your teeth. It's absolutely horrible. And that doesn't sound very loving. I mean, right? <laughs> that doesn't sound very loving. It sounds kind of harsh. You're saying that chapter 1 in the story of my life is God loves me and invites me in. And chapter two in the story of my life is God loves me and invites me in and changes me. And now chapter three, he's going to get me forever? That doesn't sound loving. But it is. It is loving. It is loving. Do you not believe me? I don't think I have the room. When we moved into our house here in Jacksonville, our kids were younger than they are now, and they saw the staircase going up to the second floor. And their immediate and unified idea was to see who could get to the top of the stairs the fastest on the outside of the banister. So you've got three kids, 10 and under, clamoring over top of each other to try to get to the very top. And do you know what we said? We said, kids, be careful. Don't do that. Get down. The way you're going is going to make you go splat on the floor. And you don't want that. You're what you're doing, what you're pursuing, what you're wanting is going to lead to pain. Look at these people. Look at these people. They, they receive an invitation of love. They receive an invitation from God to come and join in what he is doing. You receive this invitation. And what is their response? Verse 5, they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. So there's, there's two kinds of people all moving in the same direction. One are really harsh, and they, they view the servants of the living God as people that they need to mistreat, people they need to destroy, people they need to heart, hurt. But there's other people, not quite as sinister, who just receive the invitation and they don't want it. There's life, there's love, there's joy, there's Jesus, there's grace and peace and mercy and eternal hope and peace. I don't want it. And they go to do their own thing. 
They go to do their business or go to their lousy farm. They're just, they're just living their life. Hell is what happens when you make a decision to reject love and live for yourself and ultimately you get what you want. Just like I warned my kids, if you keep going that way, it's going to be bad for you. You're going to go splat. It is an act of great love for God to look at people who are trying to go their own way, who want to live a life apart from God, who want to live a life apart from love, who want to do their own thing. And God is saying, if you keep going, you are going to get burned and you're going to get burned forever because there's no love without God. There's no life without Jesus. And so he's saying, come, this is a warning that is kind and loving to you. You don't have to go that direction. You can choose love. You can come to God. You can come to peace. Warnings are an act of love that the natural conclusion of your life is hell. And so you are being warned today. I I actually have a really clear picture of how I fit into this whole thing. And I do. It's too late. Now you've heard what I've had to say. It's too late. I'm, I'm in the story of your life. These words are in the story of your life. Uh, what are you doing here? What are you doing at that church? What's, what are you doing? What are you up to? Um, here's the answer. God, <laughs> I don't deserve it. But God has invited me to be a part of his kingdom. God has invited me to have a seat at the table. I get to sit there with Jesus, and I get to sit there with others of you and just participate in joy and glory that I didn't earn and that I don't deserve. And for some reason, God has made me his slave. That's all I am. I am a slave sent from a God who loves you with one job, that's it. And the job is to let you know that God loves you. The job is to let you know that you are invited. The job is to let you know that your life can be longer and better and more glorious than you ever imagined. You can have more than you ever dreamed. It's yours. It's right here. All you have to do is take it. All you have to do is reach out your hand and believe and it will be yours. I'm I'm just a slave with that message. And you can mistreat me if you want to. You can say bad things about me if you want to. And you can ignore me if you want to. That's what happens. But I'm here today, not in my own power and strength, but sent as a slave from the great God of love to tell you you could live forever. The prophet Ezekiel, another slave, chapter 18, verse 32. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. You can have life if you'll turn. Just turn from your own way and come to God's way, and it'll be better than you ever imagined. It'll be joy beyond your wildest dreams. That's the third chapter of your life. And that's the story of your life. The story of your life is the story of God's love. And the story of your life is a very short story. It, it, it will be gone in a blink. You won't believe how fast it will come. And you won't know when it's over. It will come without warning. 
and you'll never know, but one day it'll be gone. And then the fourth chapter of your life will begin, and it will never end. It will go on and on and on. And the warning is that if you keep doing what you're doing, it will be a life of eternal weeping and pain. It'll be a life without love. It'll be a life without God. It'll be a life without joy, and it will never end. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can have. It is available to you. Oh, my goodness. Everything's ready. Everything's taken care of. All you have to do is believe, and you will enter into an eternity of an eternal wedding and joy and celebration beyond your wildest dreams. Your life is a story of forever. It's not a story about all the events. It's a story of forever. It's a story of Jesus. It's a story of God. It's a story of being invited, of being different, of knowing Jesus Christ. And you can have him if you want him. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, would you please give the gift of faith, give the gift of receiving the invitation to come. Give the gift of eternal life and joy and change and power. Father, I pray that you would soften every heart and fill your wedding hall. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.